I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. Today is Monday, April 17th, 2023. I have a great show for you today. I'll be talking with Tavi McGar. She's director of An American Tale, the musical. It's opening soon at Children's Theatre Company in South Minneapolis. Also today, Judge Lejeune Lang, president of International Leadership Institute. We're here today talking about a neighborhood community uh, recognition preservation project. Uh, the project uh, is called the Long Longfellow Journey uh, Doc Our Longfellow Our Journey Documentary, and we'll talk about that project as well. Uh, before we get into the interviews, two things. One, I want to invite you to support this work, this program, by subscribing. Uh, and you go to the YouTube Insight News channel, subscribe, like it, share it, tell your friends that we do this every day at one o'clock. We have a lot of fun. We hope that you have fun. We hope that uh, you enjoy what I call robust conversation. And the excitement is that it's like, you know, two people talking or three people talking. But what I'm aware of is that these private personal conversations are uh, staged so that uh, the whole world can listen in, lean in, and be a part of it. So we want you to be part of this conversation. Lean in uh, and share. I mean, what you can do actually is make comments on, if you're on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook or LinkedIn uh, or uh, Twitter, uh, there is a comment section and we want to hear your voice. We want to acknowledge you as well. So wherever you are, if you want to uh, say hello to us and uh, tell us where you're connecting from. We start the program with the hot topics and the ones I have today are both uh, very sad. Uh, two things. One, you know, I've been watching over the weekend the story about the four young victims killed at an Alabama Sweet 16 party uh, and an assailant uh, went to a Sweet, sweet 16 party and uh, uh, just unloaded. And uh, this is a story by Holly Yan and Isabel Rosales and Chris Boyette, Elizabeth Wolf, all of CNN. Uh, today's uh, published today. And the dateline is Dadeville, Alabama. Uh, and it says, you know, they've identified the four victims who were killed at a sweet 16 birthday party in Alabama over the weekend. I'm not going to share their names at this point, but you can find that uh, in the story. And it says at least 15 other teens were also shot and hospitalized Saturday night in Dadeville, which is a close-knit city of around 3,000 people. Investigators are asking for information about whoever turned this joyous celebration into a scene of carnage. Uh, Sergeant Jeremy Burkett of the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency said, I can, cannot stress uh, this enough. We absolutely need you to share the information. Well, shortly, just uh, briefly, uh, the gunfire erupted around 1034 Saturday night uh, in an uh, event venue in downtown Dadeville. Uh, and you know, there wasn't any apparent fight or disturbance before the shooting. Uh, and the story goes on. I'll stop there. That's one. That's sad. Uh, so we have to look at this, you know, guns in our community and gun violence. Well, uh, you, you all know that I'm a native of Kansas City, Missouri. So this story touches me personally. The second one is a piece by Tina Burnside and Amanda Jackson. Again, uh, at CNN, a story updated uh, a few minutes ago on CNN. And it says accused shooter in Kansas City shooting of a black teen uh, who went to the wrong house is a white man in his 80s. Uh, this is a breaking news update. It says a white man in his 80s is the individual who apparently shot and seriously wounded Ralph Yari, a black teen, on April 13th in Kansas City, Missouri, according to a CNN review of property records, uh, police statements, and detention records. CNN is not naming the man at this time. 
uh, given that he has not been charged. The two representatives of the Kansas City Police Department detention unit read uh, the man's booking information to CNN over the phone. They confirmed the man who was booked on an investigation hold was a white man in his 80s and in his home address. And his home address matches the address where the shooting took place. Um, they said he was uh, taken into custody on April 13th uh, and released after a couple of hours on April 14th. So Say it, say it. And there's a picture of this uh, young kid uh, with a saxophone uh, and apparently, you know, artistic, creative, gifted prayers to him and to those families impacted uh, in the other incident in Alabama as well. Well, <clears throat> let me uh, proceed with today's program. That's kind of a bummer. It's really, it really is a bummer to report on that. Despite that, we have to keep moving and figure out how we elevate and illuminate and uh, you know, focus on things that bring us hope and bring us uh, peace of mind, um, clarity in, in different ways. I think that this program is going to do that because I'm pleased to have met and to begin talking with uh, my guest from the children's theater production, uh, Taby McGar is here. Taby, good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, children's theater is one of my favorite places. It's a it's a a huge uh, and beautiful uh, uh, institution, not only in Minnesota but around the country. And before we talk about your show there, let's talk about children's theater and why children's theater is important even after my opening, what healing there is that comes from institutions like the theater and children's theater in particular. Absolutely. Thrilled to be able to talk about this. Um, you know, I, obviously theater affected my life. I <laughs> chose to chose it as my profession and um, I've been dedicated to it since I was 12 or something. Um, but I think even if you don't work in the theater, I, I think the theater is a social tool. It's a, it's a tool for, for community and a tool for conversation. In ancient Greek times, as a citizen, you were required to go to the theater. It was, it was thought of as, as an essential part to democracy, as an essential part to community um, uh, conversation and organizing. And, and, you know, I'm not here to say theater can solve poverty or solve gun violence, but I do think theater is the, the only art form where you're literally asked as a performer and asked as witnessing performance to watch somebody else step into each other's shoes. It's, it's a literalizing act of, of radical empathy um, and, and community. Um, I, you know, I, I, my personal artistic manifesto, I guess, is um, what the theater can offer us is, is the skill of imagination. Right? It has this really unique and powerful way performance to turn a milk jug into a baby, right? The mm -hmm. way an actor can just transform mm -hmm. an object or with thing, you know, we're about to head into technical rehearsals where all of the theatrical magic starts to come together and using, you know, somewhat humble tools, right? We don't have CGI. <laughs> um, it happens live and in front of you, we are able to transform um, the audience's imagination. And, and for me, the biggest thing is that imagination and social justice are entirely intertwined. Um, if you can't imagine it, you can't fight for it, right? And I feel like the theater is a place where that skill of imagination, both for the people making it, but also for the people receiving it. Um, I think it's, a, it's an incredible part of our lives and to just speak to um, what theater can do for young audiences mm -hmm. and, and the way that it can harness their imagination, their incredible imagination that I think it's slowly drained out of them over time. Um, but uh, theater is a useful tool to heighten that. And the children's theater, I mean, it's the premier children's theater um, of our art form. You know, it's, it's a big, robust, it sends its productions everywhere. I mean, the fact that... Um, almost every kid in Minnesota has been to that theater 
no other state can say that. And mm-hmm. and I remember sitting down with with Joe Hodge at the Guthrie. Sorry, then I'll stop talking. But um, <laughs> and the, uh, the Guthrie was so robust, and you had such you have such an incredible theater community actually here in Minneapolis. And he li- he linked it to children's theater that it becomes a ritual, a habit of theater going, of gathering, of mm-hmm. of talking about empathy and how to be a good person. Um, and and don't don't we need that now more than ever? We certainly, we certainly do. Well, let me tell people a little bit more about you. Tavia McGar is a director of American An American Tale, the musical, which is going to be opening uh, shortly at Children's Theater. And she's a nationally renowned theater director uh, and has had many episode credits that include uh, Nora. Uh, I think that's the right word. And maybe I'm saying this uh, and proud to present at mm-hmm. the Guthrie and is familiar. We are a third production. Uh, familiar is the is the name by Denai Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great. So uh, therefore, the reference to uh, the Guthrie in this opening remark, and now uh, this play. Uh, this is, I think, a kind of a world premiere. Yeah, yeah. So l- let's get into uh, an American tale, the musical. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, how. It, it came to your attention and to uh, the attention of the theater. How is it coming uh, to life here in Twin Cities? Yeah, so the movie premiered in 1986. Um, mm-hmm. It's an animated film, um, a sort of fable about a, um, a family of mice who are uh, Russian Jewish um, refugees who get attacked by the cats um, and the cats make them flee um, Europe and they end up on a ship and um, on the way to America, when they get separated, there's a storm and um, they end up in Manhattan and little Fievel, who's our sweet sort of growing up anti-hero, um, uh, is trying to find his family and, and the family is trying to find him. And he learns about Manhattan. He learns about American culture um, and he meets other refugees and immigrants along the way. And um, there's um, uh, there's the you meet Irish immigrants. Um, you meet um, uh, Italian immigrants who are new during this time. It's like 18. 18- and and you just sort of follow this mouse as they um, take on um, the cats in America, um, who tend to be these sort of like capitalistic um, forces that are mm-hmm. that are shaping Manhattan. Um, so that's the story. And um, I wore this VHS tape out when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> it has some incredible songs that some people might be familiar with. There are no cats in America. Mm-hmm. Out there is huge hit it's actually a big crossover hit um i think linda ronstad and someone else was saying the duet um and um yeah so uh it's actually the story of steven spielberg's own family um he was a producer story developer on it um this is you know you know early early days but um uh, yeah in a couple years ago playbill.com which is our trade magazine um, mm-hmm. released the news that Children's Theater had acquired the rights to it. And I saw it and I thought, oh, that's such a good idea. I'll never work on that. Like that's <laughs> too good. To- but through a series of circumstances, um, I was brought onto it. And um, yeah, it's been really meaningful. It's, a, it's an incredible story. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's theatrically really delicious. We, there are four songs in the movie. We, Universal said, take what you want. And we took three of them. We took, um, and, but we okay. built out a whole score. So now there's a full, I think, 12 or 13 numbers now. Yeah. It's a fairly large cast, isn't it? Or not? As, yeah, as, yeah. as Peter uh, Kath go. T- t- talk about the production. I mean, as I was reading the uh, press release, uh, it listed all of the principal, the adults, and the student actors, and then the understudies. And it seemed like a lot of people, and a lot of people from set design to yeah. uh, all the other roles that make, I mean, as an audience member, you don't think about all the complexity of uh, producing these yeah. special moments. But reading the press release, you say, holy Moses, you know, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, so, yeah. So talk about the uh, the cast, first of all, and uh, what, uh, how you develop the cast and what people bring to the roles that they play. Uh, I'm always curious about how artists themselves uh, become transformed as they do their craft. 
uh, and hopefully transform audiences as well. What what are your thoughts? Just uh, any way you want to take that, just flow with me on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Happy to. I mean, yeah, theater is, um, you know, I think it's often we don't tell the story enough to our audiences about how actually incredibly handmade the, the object is, what we make is. It's mm-hmm. incredibly labor intensive. I went um, I went to for a costume design. Costumes are incredible. Our costumes are done by um, really one of my favorite costume designers in the world actually lives here in Minneapolis, um, Trevor Bowen. I'm sure if you've been to the theater here in Minneapolis, you've seen his work at the Gut. And um, I walked into the the shop of the costumes and there's like 10 crafts people working on all of these different costumes. You know, the interaction is a great um, generator of jobs and, and um, an incredible art form for that reason. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, tons of people working in the shop. We also, um, so the cats are these sort of um, fabulistic, um, like the evil villains of the story, but mm-hmm. um, they are, they are, um, they're puppets in our production. Um, so there's, a, we have a whole puppet, local puppet designer, um, Christopher Lutter, who's an incredible local designer. I didn't know him before this process, but um, we're very lucky to have him. But yeah, there's the set designer, there's the lighting designer. There's even um, a local amazing um, person, Talvin Wilkes, who uh, is a professor at University of Minnesota. We- He's also an incredible director and um, administrator and just a really genius artist. And he he did some really amazing work with us that I'd, I'd love to talk about for a little bit, which is, um, you know, in revisiting the film when I was first brought on board, you know, um, I hadn't watched it in a while. It'd been, you know, 35 years. And it was clear to me that the lens that Spielberg was looking at New York and New York immigrants mm-hmm was relatively limited to white, um, uh, to, to white um, uh, cultures, ethnicities, races. Mm-hmm. Um, conveniently, I don't know, forget that there were, um, you know, there were black people there. There were Asian people in Manhattan during this mm-hmm. time. They were forming communities also. And what um, we brought Talvin in and the writers and I worked really long and hard to sort of expand that lens of what mm-hmm. an immigrant who an immigrant could be in Manhattan. So we did some mm-hmm. adjusting around characters. We made um, Bridget, who's sort of the fierce activist, um, a black woman who's, whose parents recently migrated from the South and sort of taken that into the fable world. You know, I mean, she's still a mouse, they're, mi- they're mice. But, mm-hmm. um, but I think it, it's a way more inclusive storytelling of Manhattan at, at that time. And that's, that's felt really meaningful. And Talvin was instrumental in helping us. Um, uh, he did, he helped us with all the rich research. I mean, we spent years on this, right? Like sure. years of, did I go out? I don't know. You did. Yeah. But you're, you're dropping every now and then, but it's okay. I think we was still, yeah. But, um, so I'm really proud of the work that Talvin has helped us with. And I'm really proud of, of the story that we're telling on stage. Yeah. You told me before we went on that uh, the story has a personal uh, feeling or connection to you because you, your dad, is from Egypt, right? Yeah. And and had the same story that's being told is kind of his story, uh, fleeing Egypt. Tell about that. So how does this become personal to your family, your your own uh, experience? Yeah, yeah. It was funny because it, it was we were a year into developing this piece when it actually dawned on me. But um, so the family is on a ship and and um, they encounter a storm. This isn't a spoiler. It happens very early in the play. But um, and they get separated and have, sort of swim through the ocean and arrive on on Manhattan at different points. But my own father, um, um, he was seventeen and Egypt. Um, uh, the revolution had just happened and Britain had left and sort of a really politically complicated time um, as the country was moving into a form of socialism. My own family was Coptic Christian. They live about three um, and we're encountering a lot of um, uh, challenges with that mm. as this country was wrestling with who they, who they are. Um, and my grandfather kind of got sent to a labor camp. My grandmother um, had a 
really hard time and ended up in a mental hospital. So it, my dad really felt like he had no options economically. Mm. There was really, there was not a lot. He didn't see a lot of way forward right. in the country. Right. And he traveled up to Alexandria um, and he waited for a month. He went to the dock every single day and waited for someone to make a mistake. Finally, someone did, and he snuck on board a ship and um, and hid and basically got found out <laughs> in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and 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 jumped. And he had nothing. He had. You mm. know, um, and he swam to the shore of Lebanon. Um, and there was a guard there. Um, and you know, he's like, "What do I do? Do I try to lie? How do I? You know, this guard is." clearly here to prevent people from me you sure. know, doing what I'm doing. Sure. And he decided, um, uh, sort of a fable in our story, but in our family story, but he decided to tell the truth. And in doing so, the, the guard said, um, uh, you know, he could have arrested him or, you know, done a million things, but he said, wait here, there's a group of boys over there. And when they leave, just follow them behind the gate. And, and, um, and he let him through and he he welcomed him and ha had his own version of welcoming him. And my dad lived in the back of a bakery for two years in Lebanon and swept the floors for food until he got papers to come to America. And all that to say there's a, there was a welcome inside of that security guard um, that I think this play is asking us all to have to our mm. revenue. No one wants to leave their country. I feel like that's, right. that's the thing that that gets lost. You're leaving your family. You're leaving what you know. You're leaving your ancestors. You're leaving your culture. You don't take these trips lightly. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like that often gets very lost in our um, refugee and immigrant stories. Um, so, so having a personal connection just helps me connect the dots more thematically. And I think um, I've made a lot of space in rehearsal because a lot of us have those kinds of stories in our family um, for us all to sort of talk about how many of us have have these backgrounds in our own sort of um, refugee stories. Yeah, so it's been it's been really meaningful. Interesting. Uh, for two reasons, uh, you're connecting with me, the idea of recognizing this notion of refugee uh, ist. Uh, my my mother is from Mississippi. And she had described herself uh, as not a, a refugee, but a person who escaped when she left, because when she left, she and sisters uh, had to leave at night because they were sharecroppers, right? And that they, in a sense, were almost bound uh, to the land or the property. And so uh, it was an act of, uh, of um, courage. Uh, to steal away at nighttime, you know. So, you know, that's interesting. So, and what you've done is brought that element of movement, not only from foreign shores, but from within the country as well. That's really kind of cool. Yeah. You know, um, are there are there transformative moments? There must be, but would you describe what to you uh, is a transformative moment in this play? And are there moments that surprise you mm. where it was, I know you're, you're looking to produce these aha moments that are magical, but sometimes they happen where you don't expect them. Yeah. I'd say part of, I, I love visual storytelling. I basically um, love set design. Like I, I love, that's probably why I chose what I do. Um, and this was such a delicious process just because of scale, right? Like you have these little bites um, and um, actually, I don't think, yeah, it's definitely not a secret, but the set designer just came in one day and was like, what if it all happens inside of a suitcase? Um, so the, the whole theater, it basically looks like one big suitcase mm. um, and, and inside are all these little mice and they're sort of, sort of like a suitcase theater. And um, it's just been great fun and um yeah there's a whole there's a, a sequence a storyline about how five gets sort of kidnapped into a sweatshop and um late one night we had them sitting on stools this sweatshop and i kept being like stool it's not right it's not right it's keeping me up at night and all of a sudden um 
it was late at night. I couldn't sleep. I was like, they should be sitting on spools, spools. So <laughs> oh, sorry. Did you lose me? No, you're so, you're, you're fine. Yeah. I mean, your voice, sometimes the screen might freeze for a second, but your voice is still good. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So, so all of a sudden in the middle of the night, I'm like, spools, what, they must be sitting on spools that would tell the story of scale so beautifully. And I ran to the prop shop because usually things like this, you, you have to ask for months in advance because they take mm. a lot of time to, to make. And our props designer, you know, um, I thought she was going to be like, no, 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 there's no time. And she said, we'll try. And, and last week she came in, she was like, I have your spools. <laughs> so, great. Uh, so those, those have been like delicious discoveries. Um, but I, I think emotionally, the biggest discovery is, you know, I think, um, you know, like the, like the news that you were relaying at the top of the hour, I can get, um, I imagine we've all had some moment of this. It, it can be um, it can be really hard to believe in America these days, um, uh, and um, it can be really frustrating. And um, part of the climax of the musical is um, Henri is this pigeon who's building a statue and happens to be the Statue of Liberty. Um, mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it's unfinished, and then at the mm -hmm. end, it's finished. And I spent a lot of the last few years we've been developing this like wondering is that like too hopeful like have we earned that statue actually i don't know um do we earn the hope that this piece is asking us to have in this great experiment america and um what's been uplifting in the moment is you know we have this inc is this youth ensemble that mm. we have this we professional young artists and the diversity and the sort of um, immense imagination that these kids have and their ambition and their focus and their rigor and their their pure love for this art form has actually like I cry every time we run it now it's like them standing in front of the Statue of Liberty it makes me want to believe in in the power of America just watching these these children work it's like it's done something for me spiritually in my relationship with America where I, I can still get very mad at it, but um, it has, it's made sure. me, it's made me want to fight, fight for, or fight for it. Well, that's what hope is about, I think. And that's what, uh, you know, faith and hope will do is uh, keep you focused on, uh, you know, creating a future uh, that uh, elevates uh, the best that we have. Uh, in ourselves and for each other as well. A couple of last questions before I let you go. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Um, have you had a chance to preview this in front of audience, audiences yet? When do when do when do people come to see this the first time? A week from tomorrow. I think okay. it's a, our first preview is April from Tuesday, April twenty fifth. Um, we've had a series of workshops where some you know friends and family of, of mm -hmm. the children's theater have been involved. But um, yeah, what's been, the, what, what's been the reaction so far for the oh, few lucky people that've seen parts of it? Yeah, workshops? they've been loving it. I mean, it's it's I really can't say enough about the writers that adapting a film, first of all, extremely difficult. Adapting mm -hmm. an animated film, even more difficult. There's so many things we can't do in theater. So you have to harness what theater has to offer and they've just done an incredible job. The songs are incredible. The talent on stage is incredible. Um, so yeah, come come join us for the, for the premiere. What are the future plans for An American Tale, the musical? What's gonna happen after the run at Children's Theater? Oh, listen, um, we want it to go everywhere. I think it has such a powerful message and it's it's such a fun piece of theater. And, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think our hopes for it are really high and we want it to reach as many people as possible. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we're really excited. I'm sure this won't be the last production, but but come see it while it's new, for sure. <laughs> so um, let's invite people to come to the opening and to enjoy it several times while it's, yes. while it's running. Why don't you do that? And then I want to uh, have you close on talking about uh, uh, Tavi McGar's future. Uh, what's down the road for you beyond this project? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, I So I run a theater company. Um, I'm a co-artistic director at Philadelphia Theater Company. And um, uh, I just started this past September and we're launching our 
first season. So if you know anyone in Philadelphia who wants to um, uh, come see some great theater, um, send them to Philadelphia Theater Company. But um, I also... Uh, one, one, one of our producers yeah, is in Philadelphia, so I'll, I'll connect him with you. Oh, he's, yeah, oh he's yeah, great. great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, no, Philly's a great town. Um, so there's that. And then I have, a, I have a wonderful show going up off Broadway this summer called The Half God of Rainfall. That um, is a really spectacular piece of theater um, around the intersection of Nigerian mythology and Greek mythology. Wow. So if you're in Manhattan, come on by. I'm, I'm curious about that. <laughs> That's another another conversation. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, well, uh, so uh, invite people again. Let's um, extend the invitation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So come no, to the American Tale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. April 25th, okay. Children's Theater. Tavi McGar, thank you so much. So good to meet you and uh, all the very, very best to you. Uh, hello to my friend Peter Brosius and all the wonderful cast over there at Children's Theater. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right, we'll see you. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed speaking with her. And, uh, you know, just this idea of what theater can do, what it means, and how it enables uh, families, children, audiences, as she said, to put themselves in another person sh person's shoes, and how it allows uh, the creation uh, of empathy, uh, awareness, understanding, all of that and more, and the Children's Theater of Minneapolis, uh, just a huge, huge uh, organization. So support them, uh, attend this show. Let me move to the second part of today's program. I see that my friend, uh, Judge, the Honorable Judge Lejeune Lang is here. And uh, Lejeune Lang is the uh, a former uh, Hennepin County uh, de public defender, a former judge in Hennepin County, and uh, uh, also I think he presently is president of the International Leadership Institute. I'm going to ask her about all of those things uh, over the course of the next half an hour in our conversation, but she's here today to talk about her work with uh, a project in Longfellow, a South Minneapolis neighborhood. It's a documentary called Longfellow our journey documentary. And uh, we wanted to welcome her and have her talk about her interest in and you know the power, the importance, the, the need to elevate community. Uh, Judge Lejeune, good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you for being here. And how are you? And are you able to hear me okay? Hello, Al. The volume is very low. I'm. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Okay, well, your volume is perfect on this side, so I hear you perfectly, and maybe you simply have to adjust your volume output on your machine, but hopefully you, you'll be able to hear me. But you're coming across very uh, clear on this side. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Now something happened and you you're muted. So well, we're gonna, let's let's do this. You have to find the unmute button on your machine. And there we go. Oh, off back on again. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. So I was saying it's been a I'm while. I'm very so happy to be here this afternoon with you to talk about the work of the International Leadership Institute on our Longfellow project. We've been exploring okay. the history of early African-Americans, particularly those who came as slaves to Fort Snelling and those who came as what were later called contraband to Fort Snelling, people who fled the South uh, in 1863 and came to Fort Snelling on ships, steamships that were hired by Fort Snelling. I'm sure you've heard of Robert Hickman and many others from St. Paul, yes. but there's more to the story. Uh, our research has shown that close to 600 African Americans came to Minnesota during that period around 1863. And what they were able to do was incredible. In less than five years, these uh, families came uh, 
to Minnesota and were able to get the Constitution of Minnesota changed so they could have the right to vote ahead of the federal protections that were provided later in the 15th Amendment. So we have, at, in Minnesota, African descended people have always been uh, leaders and at the center of the American story. So our work is showing uh, decade by decade these documentations with regard to African descendant people. So we're looking at the arrival on the banks of the Mississippi River of Dred Scott and looking at the arrival on the banks of the Mississippi River of the men and women and children labeled as contraband. So in the Longfellow Project, we've created a film. We've also had the opportunity to uh, interview some of the descendants of those early families. And actually, uh, through the assistance of Native American elders, find the locations where uh, the oral history of Native Americans say these boats actually landed. So it's been a very, very uh, important work. It's very emotional to meet some of these family members and interview their descendants and the stories that they have and held within their families and to be able to take, uh, we took one family from, uh, I think you've heard of W. Harry Davis Sr. and his son, sure. Harry Davis Jr. Yeah, of course. We took Harry Davis Jr. to Fort Snelling to retrace his great-great-grandfather's arrival in 1863 to Fort Snelling as a soldier. His great-great-grandfather had served in the Massachusetts 54 Regiment and also served in the General Army in the Civil War. So, and came to Minnesota, settled and raised uh, a family. And so seeing those roots, being able to see, uh, confirm the oral history of the family within the records of Fort Snelling was uh, just an uh, incredible opportunity to allow for Mr. Davis and his family. Are you finding things that the families don't know or the families discovering uh, more about their own lineage as a result of this research that you're doing? Well, we are continuing this work because there's so many families in not only in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but black families settled in Fergus Falls. They settled in Duluth. They settled in uh the southern part of Minnesota, all over the state. Mm -hmm. And so we're going uh, area by area, looking at families. And of course, one of the families that you already heard about is the Cheatham family, the first uh, known black firefighter in the Minneapolis Fire Department. He also came in 1863 as part of that wave of uh, escaped, uh, emancipators, those who mm -hmm. wanted to uh, get away as far as possible from slavery and get on the boats that were chartered by the Fort Snelling. Of course, Fort Snelling had a manpower shortage because many of the young men were already fighting in the Civil War. So they, uh, they conceived this idea to be able to have additional Black workers. We have not been able to confirm that these workers were paid or not. We know that the other approximately 100 people over the years at Fort Snelling who were enslaved were in true slave labor. They did not even have uh, beds to sleep in or slave shacks to, to lay their head. They had to sleep in the doorways at the fort and serve at the will of the officers they were uh, assigned and uh, bound to. So it has been uh, an important thing to raise that whole issue of enslavement and the historic site of enslavement of Fort Snelling, which of course at that time encompassed the Hiawatha Golf Course and much of South Minneapolis. So many people when they're out for a stroll 
uh, have no idea that they're walking on land that our our ancestors were enslaved. That's amazing. We've got uh, a video, I think part of the um, documentary, we're going to show that and come back and talk about that. Uh, if you want to get that queued up, uh, you ask me, let's watch that now, and then we'll come back and continue the conversation with Judge Lejeune Lang. Well, we have been at the center this, of Minnesota. This is Fort Snelling Both State Park, Min what used to be Dakota land, and what they believe was a place of creation. This same land would be the origin of many African American roots in Minnesota. In 1863, the Davenport and Northerner brought more than 500 newly freed enslaved men, women, and children from the South. The boats docked right here. Their ropes were tied around these very trees leaving century-old scars in the wood. In the oral tradition of the Dakota people, it is said that the boat that brought Dred Scott to Minnesota anchored to one of these trees. Our history is rarely told, but we've been here all along. So where did we go from here? Well, that's that's interesting. <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, yes, we we want to lift up our history. It's there, but it's been in the cupboard. So we're trying to unlock the cupboard and bring our presence and our narrative to uh, our children, to our city officials, uh, to the country, to show that we've been here all the time. <laughs> Uh, talk about uh, how this fits into your vision and your work uh, and as a project of the International Leadership Institute, you working around the world uh, on the issue of uh, justice and economic empowerment. What's the connection uh, between this project, looking at uh, the movement and memory of Africans uh, formerly enslaved from that system to the, the potential of freedom here in Minnesota. What's the connection to the overall broad scope of work of the International Leadership Institute? Well, I think the two most important cases in the history of the United States in terms of human rights and African Americans are the Dred Scott case and the George Floyd cases. And by them occurring less than three miles apart on this same uh, south side of Minneapolis, the same plot of ground where our ancestors have been is of significance. The Dred Scott case impacted the world. It lit the spark for the Civil War and the aspiration of African Americans to be free. And George Floyd's case, the trials, the torture, the abuse was seen around the world and it's still lighting a spark that will not be extinguished for human rights and protection and advancement of African descendant people, not only in Minnesota, but around the world. And so these two things happened within three miles of each other Many people do not even know that Dred Scott lived in Minnesota. If they learned anything about it, uh, which I learned in law school, the details, they said the law school book said the Wisconsin Territory. That was before Minnesota became a state. So nobody follows the geography to understand that's that same Fort Snelling that's out by the airport. So it's important to understand where we are with the whirlwinds of history. And we've been at the epicenter for almost 200 years, more than 200 years of important developments. Take a minute, uh, uh, Judge Lejeune, and talk about Dred Scott. You described it as a flashpoint, uh, a spark for the Civil War. Uh, somebody listening doesn't know what that means. So if you don't mind, uh, give us a history lesson on 
Dred Scott and the Dred Scott decision and how that played into uh, a seismic shift in the direction of the United States of America and of the world. It's very important to know that Dred Scott's great great granddaughter has a Dred Scott Foundation in St. Louis. We, uh, through uh, Roxanne Givens and others, we were able to bring her up to Fort Snelling for the first time approximately 10 years ago. And she has made occasional visits since that time. But we want to introduce her to our children here in Minnesota and to more and more people so that that link between uh, Dred Scott being freed and suing in St. Louis and living in Minnesota where it was the basis for his lawsuit for freedom, that connection remains visible and understood. And so it is, uh, it is uh, we're very privileged to have uh, the, the Dred Scott Foundation want to keep that connection and grow that connection uh, in Minnesota. So it's going to be on our community, the African-American community, to lift up the visibility and make that link. Uh, we should have, at minimum, uh, statutes to Dred Scott in Minnesota, streets named after Dred Scott in Minnesota. But we, as the African-descended community, are going to have to take that initiative. Our organization, the International Leadership Institute, was able to save a formerly all-Black fire station at 4501 Hiawatha Avenue. It was uh, made into a landmark by the city of Minneapolis, so it can't be destroyed. But that station represented intentional segregation by the city of Minneapolis to uh, have Black firefighters serve uh, in their own uh, brigade. And of course, we know over time that history, after that fire station was closed, blacks were closed out of the entire fire department for 30 years. So these things keep going in cycles. So we need to understand how important the history is to what happens in the future. The film said this was uh, the tree that, uh, the boat that brought Dred Scott anchored to. Uh, talk about that, just a refresher. Who was Dred Scott? How did he come to Minnesota and why? And why uh, was his bid for freedom in the court so significant? Dred Scott was very critical to the history of the United States and particularly uh, to African descendant people. Dred Scott had been enslaved at Fort Snelling and was forced to go to Missouri because uh, he was summoned by Dr. Emerson. When Dr. Emerson passed away and the widow uh, was there, Dred Scott and his wife attempted to buy their freedom. They had earned enough money from their independent time in Minnesota to be able to pay a fair price to uh, be uh, emancipated. But she had turned over the uh, administration of her so-called enslaved people to her uh, brother, and her brother refused to allow Dred Scott and Harriet to buy their freedom. They sued in the Missouri courts. Uh, they lost because as we know, courts can face political pressure and suddenly things that we call precedent or traditional decisions suddenly change. And in Missouri, the Supreme Court had changed their position of allowing someone to uh, be uh, liberated when they had lived in a free territory. So Dred Scott and Harriet Scott had to appeal their case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the meantime, they had to hide their children so that their children wouldn't be grabbed up and sold uh, into slavery somewhere else while they fought this case. So every step of the way was a hardship for the entire family. 
when Dred Scott got to the case, got to the U.S. Supreme Court, the uh, political situation was so uh, fraught that the Supreme Court asked, delayed the decision and asked uh, them to come a second time to argue before the Supreme Court a second time. And so when they did that, it the nation was even uh, more on edge with regard to slavery. So the history tells us that Justice Taney wrote his decision while running between the Supreme Court and the White House, trying to look at the political winds and how to word his decision for the political maximum of the party that he was loyal to. And of course now, uh, even our conservative Supreme Court admits the Dred Scott case was the worst decided case in the history of the Supreme Court because they were trying to seek a political end and trampled on all of jurisprudence and rationality in the decision. So when I was in law school, the line that slapped me in the face was, a black man has no rights that a white man's bound to respect. When I read that language, I'm like, we are at the root of white supremacy coming from the mouth of the Supreme Court justices declaring open and unambiguously that we don't matter. Mm -hmm. And so everyone uh, who was of courage in this country knew that that was a line that had gone too far. So we ended up watching our nation prepare and fracture for civil war, the assassination of a president, the try to undo the Freedmen's Bureau, the reconstruction fighting. But we, here we are, we're still here, we're still fighting. We still understand the importance of full participation in this country that we helped create and sustain. And so being able to share these stories and, and daylight this history ha has been a real joy. You've been doing a lot of work in Africa. Talk about the uh, ILI's initiative in Africa, uh, particularly the uh, Southern Africa, Central Africa uh, business initiatives. Well, I think, Al, one of the things that we need to do in Minnesota is take credit for the incredible things that we've done and then build on that as an example for the future. This, this whole group of so-called contraband who came with just the clothes on their back in 1863, in less than 100 years, had achieved something in terms of home ownership, business ownership, doctors, lawyers, churches, community in less than 100 years that we have never met. Now, today in 2023, we have a 50% lower home ownership than we did in 1950 for Black community. Mm. And so to know it's part of our job to know how did we lose so much ground? What happened? Mm -hmm. And so we look at freeway construction, which deliberately decimated our community. We look at so-called urban renewal programs, which deliberately decimated our community. We look at the Great Society program, which deliberately decimated our community and steered our community into a corral of rental housing so that there would not be net worth passed from one generation to another. A child age is 17 years old who got pregnant, could get her own apartment. And we know now that we have so many single mothers whose net worth is only $5 because mm -hmm. we have no ownership in any property and we have no savings and we have no safety net. And so knowing that our ancestors facing segregated hotels, segregated housing, lack of opportunity, we're still able to collectively buy homes, build churches, recruit doctors to come here because of the segregation and the poor treatment. 
we have to be able to take some lessons from them to get out of the situation we're in now. What's the relationship between Africans in this country and Africans in the continent? How do our fortunes uh, and our futures uh, um, correspond or relate? Or, or are they linked in your point of view from your work at the Institute? Well, I think one of the things we're learning from this research, uh, for example, looking at W. Harry Davis, who came from uh, 1863 Civil War veterans uh, descendants, W. Harry Davis uh, lived in North Minneapolis. And at a certain point, he moved to South Minneapolis, but he never left North Minneapolis. He viewed his community as the whole city. So he worked and nurtured Phyllis Wheatley and those programs and the importance of the settlement house to be able to have wraparound services for individuals, have community space, have camping, horseback riding, things that brought peace, peace of mind, uh, entry to the outdoors, uh, brought a stable realization from the rat infested slums. Mm. And so Harry stuck with that. He stuck with the boxing and he also continued to build across the city in South Minneapolis, working on uh, desegregating the Hiawatha golf course and in turn desegregating the very neighborhood where the Hiawatha golf course was. So when you hear about the hail and field uh, pairing, that was the same neighborhood uh, that the Hiawatha Golf Course served. So we have just a dedication layer by layer to do the best for the children, but it didn't stop at a boundary in terms of whether you were a North Sider or South Sider. So I think that's an important piece of information that we can uh, use that Harry, a uh, part of his legacy. And so I'm taking that to mean that uh, if we say there's no boundary, then we have to look at the entire uh, African community globally, North and South America and Africa as ours uh, in order to create, to connect and to build and to transform. Uh, Judge Lejeune Lang, thank you so much for being here. We're out of time right now. This has been a wonderful conversation. I would like to invite you back to go even deeper into these rich stories uh, that you've uncovered and that you're creating uh, from your research. Uh, thank you so much for being here. So good to see you again. I'm Al McFarland. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to coming back. Uh, we're planning to do some programs at Sumner. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, too. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time.